Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so, is this not a beautiful facility? How many of you, this is your first time being at the Eight, eight Days of Hope facility? Oh. Yeah. God is good. He has provided for this ministry, definitely. Uh, so, um, and one thing that I know about Steve Tiber and his staff in Eight Days of Hope is that when God blesses the ministry, it goes out. That this ministry is a conduit and they're always blessing others. Um, so I just do want to go over, by the way, my name is Ann Reed and I am a writer for the American Family Association. I've had the, the honor and privilege of, of interviewing most of our speakers uh, for different articles that we've run over the years, so it's a privilege to be able to introduce them today. Um, so just am so grateful for everyone being here and being among like-minded believers, and you guys are going to learn a lot today. We've got great speakers who are both knowledgeable and very passionate, and I think we'll all leave here today knowing more and with a deeper, stronger conviction to do something that we weren't doing before. So I do want to go ahead and uh, welcome Steve Tiber, uh, President and CEO of Eight Days of Hope. Good morning. It is great to be here today. Thank you so much for, um, I don't know where that, is that my, my mic? Yeah, you're loud. I'm loud, I'm from New York now, so you know how that goes. But we are so grateful that you are here today, and we're excited on behalf of 8 Days of Hope to host this conference. So many good faces to see, I wanna hug all of you. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, just very briefly about 8 Days of Hope, 60 seconds, just so you're a little bit in tune. This building is our national headquarters and our training facility. Dollars given for this building was given specifically for this building. It wasn't uh, dollars we took from Harvey or Michael or Katrina. And so I love how God has continued to, um, uh, in essence, uh, live out the prayer of Jabez to eight days of hope. So our national headquarters and training facilities here. During lunch today, walk around. Um, we have offices here available for ministries that are just launching at no charge. And if you're a ministry looking for space that are established, uh, you can rent space below market value. Uh, but take a walk around the facility, and uh, it's amazing. This was built by volunteers. I mean, isn't that so awesome? Uh, Eight Days of Hope now has a facility in Buffalo, New York. That's our northeast satellite. That's where I'm kind of at these days. I go back and forth. So whenever there's a disaster in the Northeast, we have equipment and leaders that, that leave Buffalo and come from around the country. In January, our goal is to open up a satellite in the Midwest in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And then two years from January uh, 2022, uh, our goal is to open up something in California. So within a couple of years, we'll have four facilities, four sets of leaders, four sets of equipment, so we can be at four different spots at one time. And in a couple of minutes, you're going to hear about a new arm of the ministry uh, that we're really excited to talk about as well. But today, uh, I just want to talk just for a couple minutes. Uh, the theme of what I want to share with you is it takes all of us. It takes all of us. You know, um, I, I watch when you watch horses run, they, they, they wear blinders. And they wear blinders for a couple of reasons. One, they don't want to get distracted of what's going on to the left and right. And also, they don't want to panic. So when, when a horse races, it has a blinder so it can look straight ahead and focus on just what's happening straight ahead, not looking to the left or right. I really feel that we, the church, have our blinders on when it comes to sex trafficking. There are 9,000 massage parlors in America. 9,000. That you and I drive by in Memphis and South Haven and Houston and Buffalo and Niagara Falls and Detroit, we see them in strip malls. A tanning business here, a burrito business here, and there's a massage parlor. And we have our blinders on, and we don't either want to think about what's really going on in there, or we've got other things to focus on. Today I want to encourage you, this is the time for the church to take the lead on the second largest illegal activity in the world next to drugs. A $99 billion a year industry. A child is kidnapped, and that child brings between forty and sixty thousand dollars to their pimp a year, and we have our blinders on. It's the fastest growing crime in the world. 
Um, the massage parlors, the 9,000 across America, generate somewhere between two and three billion dollars. There's been an 800% increase in reported child sex trafficking over the last 10 years. And we have our blinders on. It's interesting is uh, I'm not the biggest animal lover, right? Those who know me uh, know I'm not. But I, we've had pets in our house for 35 years because I've been married for 35 years. And I say, yes, ma'am, right? Um, do you know there's 13,000 animal shelters in America? Do you know there's 600 beds in America for someone who's rescued from sex trafficking? Let that soak in just for a minute. Nothing against animal shelters. There's 13,000 animal shelters in America, and there's 600 beds as of today that if you rescue somebody from being trafficked, there's 600 beds that they can go sleep in and get to be ministered to. That's got to change. We have got to lead that change. Today, I'm ready to take my blinders off. I pray that when you leave here, your blinders come off too. So why did my blinders come off and when did it start to click for me? About six years ago, my wife and I heard a four-week message on orphans. Uh, we had three children. We were about to become empty nesters. In our mid-50s, we decided to go adopt a female from an Asian country to do our part in stopping trafficking of girls who get aged out through the orphan system. Well, she had a sister. So as Emma says, the youngest says, well, Dad, you buy one, you get one free. It didn't work that way. <laughs> we didn't buy anything. But there were some dollars that were moved around right, to do what we had to do. But when I went to that orphanage in Taiwan, I asked them, well, what happens when a young lady ages out? And they say they go front door. We give them clothes and, and, mon and the monies they have, usually three to $400. I said, no, no, you didn't answer the question. What happens to them when they get aged out? They say, we tell you. They go to the front door. And these traffickers, they have people. They scout these orphanages. And then they, tell, they text each other, hey, one's at the front door. They're walking down the street. And then someone comes in, they groom them. If you don't know what I mean about grooming, you'll probably learn a lot more by the end of the day. And it starts that quickly. Church, we've got to take our blinders off. Well, when we adopted Elise and Emma, uh, that year, I helped lead a Christian music festival called Kingdom Bound up in New York at Six Flags, a very large Christian music festival. And I was walking down, and someone had saw a video about Eight Days of Hope that we have rebuilt 5,500 homes after natural disasters, $50 million of work. And, you know, and she came, came up to me and she says, my name is Julie Palmer. I lead an organization called PATH, People Against Trafficking Humans. And I believe that God wants me to speak to you. Okay. Have you ever thought about what Eight Days of Hope can do with their volunteer base to help out sex traffic victims? Well, I really haven't. I know a little bit about it because we just adopted these two precious girls last year from, from Taiwan. And so, yes, you know, I'm, I'm becoming more aware of it. And that's how God connected the dots. She educated me, and we spent time with her. And at some point, we'll tell you how we're going to aid her. And, and the last story I want to share is how my blinders came off. I'm going to change his name in the state because I don't have his permission to use his name this morning. I couldn't get a hold of him. But I'm going to say Tom. I talked to Tom. Tom is a father. And something happened three years ago in six days that has forever changed his life. So Tom's daughter graduates high school and she decides to go to Panama City to beach with a, a newer friend that she had only met about six months ago. And, uh, she goes down there and her father and mother are very protective and you know stay in contact and they didn't know that someone had befriended her over the last 18 months through Snapchat, social media. Social media is being used by those traffickers like you do not, you would never even understand. It is crazy. So anyways, a false ID, a false person developed on a social media site befriends this young lady and, and long story short, he knows she's at Panama City, and he kidnaps her. <coughs> the father, the next day, doesn't hear from his daughter. He starts to panic. Something's up. And the lady she went to the beach with 
called him and said, Tom, your daughter and I went out last night. Someone picked us up. We went to a couple clubs, and I don't know where she's at. This guy had deep connections in Washington, D.C., and, and realized that he had to move very quickly. He knew that his daughter had been kidnapped. And so he used some legal and illegal methods. He hired a team of six black ops, Green Beret type people. I, I, I was going to find out that detail. He wrote a big boy check to them and said, find my daughter. They found her six days later. When they found her, they found the gentleman who had kidnapped her. Uh, I'm not going to go into too many details, but these six people that he hired threatened the young man with his life that they needed to find out where she was, and if he didn't do it, something very evil would happen to him. He made a phone call. Tom found his daughter at a Kroger parking lot, just wearing panties, no other clothes. Six days after his homecoming queen of their high school at a Christian school, is kidnapped, she strung out on heroin, and she has six tattoos over her body, including her neck and her face. They had branded her. She was under 21 at the time, and so, of course, he took her to the hospital, and she was there for two days, and they did all they can to do medically, and then at that point, they said, we've done all we can. He needed to take her home. He said, what home? They know where she lives. She doesn't feel safe in her own home. We can't take her home. Where do I go? 38 states in America do not have a place for someone under the age of 21 who's been trafficked to stay more than when they get their medical attention. And I think today, by the end of the day, you're going to hear many opportunities for you to take your blinders off for your church, your business, for you personally to invest your time and the resources God's blessed you with to make a difference. Church, it's time to take our blinders off. This young man started now a national movement and he is uh, on the board of an organization that we will be announcing here in a couple seconds that we're going to support. And uh, they're, they, they have the largest facility in the country, 48 beds. 48 beds outside a major city where 48 beds wouldn't even put a baby touch on the, the big issue that, that is happening right now. Here's the killer to the story that breaks my heart. The gentleman that had kidnapped his daughter goes to court and he wasn't even sentenced a day in jail. He got fined $10,000. Tom was in the court. The guy didn't know Tom was in the court. They went out to the lobby. Tom was ready to take things in his own hands. As a father of three daughters, I would be tempted to do the same thing. He was fined ten thousand dollars. He was waiting for the guy to come outside. The guy makes a phone call. Within ten to fifteen minutes, a guy shows up with a briefcase. Ten thousand dollars in cash to pay his fine. Check. Back to business. We've got to take our blinders off, church. Thirty-eight states, nowhere to go. I'm just about done, but I was asking God the question after that third touch of what's going on in the country. You can't ignore it. And I remember just driving down the road by myself, and when I'm by myself, I pray and I talk to God and I try to listen. I'm not the best listener, but I try to listen. But I asked him a simple question. God, where are you in all this? Where are you in all this? And I heard loud and clear, no, where are you in all of this? Eight Days of Hope is announcing a new arm of the ministry. Um, we are going to help ministries that are ministering to those who are brokenhearted and have been rescued from the most horrendous crime, I believe, that is known to mankind. Our commitment as an organization is that we're going to continue to do natural disasters, and we're not changing who we help and what we do, but we're adding to the, the plate. 
We have leaders, 152 volunteer leaders, who are passionate about taking their blinders off and making a difference. Our commitment is simple. You can go to our website under what we do, click on that, and you'll see safe house construction. Any ministry in the country that needs assistance, rebuilding a facility, updating their kitchen, adding something, or building brand new, we will provide 35 skilled professionals for 14 days at no charge. Today we're ready to announce that our first one will be in the city of Houston, Texas, the fourth largest city in the country, and long suspected as being either the number one or number two city in America for sex trafficking. We will be partnering with an organization called Elijah Rising. Uh, Ricky and Glenda Russell from Kentucky will be our day-to-day -day leaders. They'll be supported by Chris Childs, Dan Garrick, uh, Adam Haynes, myself, Wayne Van Lanham, and many others. But our goal, is to help before the end of the year Houston and Elijah Rising and an organization called The Refuge in Austin, Texas. After that, we are looking at Indianapolis. We will be partnering with Frank and Linda Reich, uh, head coach of the Indianapolis Colts, and their foundation called Ascent 121. And we also will be serving an organization in Buffalo, New York called PATH, People Against Trafficking Humans. Our goal is simple. We would like to do two of these before the end of the year to help these ministries expand their facilities. The goal is in 2020, at some point, we start doing one a month. Every month, somewhere in the country, Eight Days of Hope partnering with a ministry to take these 600 beds and, and blow it up in, in a positive way. So 38 states. If a church says we want to be on the front line or ready to take off our blinders, we can support that church in the efforts. So if you know anyone that leads a ministry that provides safe houses across the country, share our website, share the page. There's a simple application. For more details, you can go to our website. Finally, I just want to say this. I'm going to introduce uh, the next speaker in a minute, David Ball with Anchor Church Grace and, and Ministry, uh, Grace and Mercy Ministries. Hope I didn't mess it up, David. Known David a long time. Eight Days of Hope is coming to Tupelo, Mississippi, to partner with Grace and Mercy to build a facility right here in Northeast Mississippi. So there's no reason why you can't be a part of solving in ministering to what I think is the most horrific crime known to mankind. What is God calling you to do? You ready to take your blinders off? It's not a fun topic to talk about. We left that orphanage. There were 300 girls still sitting there. Those are my daughter's friends. I'm not blind to think that all of them are being sex trafficked, but I'm also not blind to think that not one of them have been aged out and are being mistreated. We are better than that. Church, it's time to be the church. If you belong to a church in Northeast Mississippi, I don't care what church is leading the charge. I love my brother, but it's time for First Baptist, Hope, St. James, West Jackson, uh, inner city, outer city, ethnic, it doesn't matter. This is the time for us to take the lead. We are going to do our part. Thank you for coming. Let me introduce David Ball to you. When all of this was, was going on, and, and Steve, at the same time, God was at at work in my life in a, in a major way. Uh, a lot of you know my story. My story, I came out of a, a coaching. I was a basketball coach at Tupelo High School for six years. During that time, God used me as uh, traveling and speaking and doing youth revivals. And uh, I was seeing, you know, a lot of souls being saved, a lot of my players being saved. Uh, I was reaching out to uh, a whole lot of people to minister uh, through coaching. And in that time, as a basketball coach, football coach in Alabama and Mississippi. And I was on the steps in, um, in Alabama through a, a series of events 
I was, uh, God was pressing on my heart that it's time for me to, to walk out of a career. Guys, I never thought, I thought I would be buried behind a gym somewhere. I, I, I never wanted to not coach. Uh, I was intense as an athlete. I was intense uh, as a coach. And, and I, I loved my job as a coach. I loved working and watching boys grow to men. Uh, that was, you know, one of the most beautiful things. I would get them in the eighth grade, seventh grade, and junior high, and I'd watch them grow to seniors and 18-year-olds going out. A lot of those guys are still calling me today. Uh, a lot of them call me pop. A lot of them call me dad uh, because I was the only father figure in their life, and so I loved it. I, I loved my profession. But I heard not an audible voice, but I heard the voice of God say to me in Sylacauga, Alabama, sitting on the steps, <coughs> He said, David, do you, do you love me? And I said, yes, Lord, I love you. And he said, do you love me more in coaching? And I said, God, you sound like my wife. <laughs> yes, Lord, I love you more than coaching. And he said, I want you to give it up. I want you to walk away from it. 385 wins, 27 college basketball players, successful career. I'd just been appointed to a committee of eight basketball coaches for, for the rules committee for the nation. Uh, my career was, was right in the middle of it, 40 years of age, and, and, and just excited about that career. And God said, walk away from it, lay it down, give it up. I sat down on some steps and I said, God, I can't, I can't make this mistake if it is a mistake. I can't, I can't just be emotional about this and walk away from a career that I'm successful in to do something uh, that I know about. You're going to call me into the pastorate. You're going to call me to preach. Um, I'm a PK. My dad was a pastor for 40 years. I know what that entails. I would rather have teenage boys than adults any day. <laughs> So, God, if this, is, if this is what you have for me, then I got to know. I got to know. I got to know. And in that moment, uh, the Holy Spirit just pressed on my heart. I got a phone call. And that phone call was just God saying, this is what I want you to do. And my wife came home, and I thought I was visiting a shocker. And I said, look, I feel like God's calling me in full-time ministry. And she said, I didn't know when this day was coming, but I knew it was coming. I was like, wow, we should have let me in on it. This is a shocker. <laughs> this is a shocker to me. And so at that moment, God began to do something. And I sat down and I said, okay, God, if we're going to do this, this is what I'm asking. It's my fleece. And please, I'm not, I don't want you to question my theology in this, all right? Uh, but this was my fleece that I threw out. I said, okay, God, if you're calling me to babysit a congregation, please leave me in coaching. If, if I'm just going to have church, just leave me alone. Let me coach. I'm seeing kids saved. I'm, I'm doing ministry. But God, if you want to do something supernatural that man can't explain nor take the credit for, I'm your man. God, if you want to ask to do the difficult, what nobody wants to do, I'll do it, God. I'll step out and I'll do it, but let's do something big. I forgot those words. God didn't. He didn't. So when I went into ministry, and I went into traditional ministry, traditional church, and I started saying to the church, guys, we got to get outside the walls. This is why God didn't call us to attend church. Do you know the most important event in a Christian's life doesn't happen on Sunday morning? It's what we do from Monday to Saturday that impacts the world. The church is not impacting the world. We're just wanting to build a drawbridge uh, around a congregation. And we say, God, protect us from the evil outside. And he said, I am the light. I am the salt. I've called you into the world. I said, okay, God, I, I, I'm, I'm buying in. I want to do this. Well, guys, it didn't take long for me to realize traditional church doesn't want to do this. It didn't take me long to say that when you start challenging people at the very core, I'm talking about the very core, that say, hey, it's not about being comfortable. Matter of fact, it, it, the more uncomfortable you are, probably the closer to the will of God you are. Okay, well. And so what God began to tell me was you got to do something, something else. you got to get outside the wall. God gave me a vision. The vision was provide help, hope, and healing to hurting people. Now, I don't tell many people this, but I think this morning is very important, so I'm going to share this with you. The way God did that for me. He opened my ears and I began to hear people crying for help. People would sit in there telling me something and inside, and, and literally I would be listening to what they're saying, but inside of them I'm hearing them crying for help. I would hear people be, be angry at me, angry at me, and inside I heard them crying for help. At that point I said, okay, God, what do we do? What does it look like to provide help, hope, and healing to hurting people? What does that look like? 
So I ended up in Sarasota, Florida. I ended up with a pastor friend of mine named Jim Miner. He had been in ministry for 28 years, and he had a street ministry, and he ministered to people on the street. He had a traditional church in Miami. He moved to Tampa, right outside of Tampa in Sarasota. And through a, a series of events, he invited my wife and I down to Sarasota, Florida, the most beautiful beach in the world, for a week to find out what they do as far as ministering help, hope, and healing to hurting people. I said, of course, we'll go to the beach seven days, right? We'll go down there. God wrecked me in the most beautiful way. Because all of a sudden, I began to see my people, the ones God's called me to. For the first time in my life, I realized there are people everywhere crying for help. So we started ministry. Jim Miner said, you have to render people unto the Lord. He used that illustration of the lawyer trying to trap Jesus. The way he tried to trap Jesus was about taxes. Remember that? Should we pay our taxes? He says, yes, then everybody get mad and walk out. If he says, no, the Roman soldiers would come and carry him and carry him out, right? They thought they had him trapped, and he said, whose image is on that coin? Caesar's. He says, well, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and we use that to be good citizens, which we ought to be, which we ought to support our nation, our leadership, and make sure we do everything that we can to push our nation in the direction God's called us to. But we leave out what is inferred in that passage. Because he said, and unto the Lord, that this is the Lord's. But he was repeating the same statement. He was saying, and render unto the Lord that that bears the Lord's image. Two words there. Lord's image and render. So what I, I felt in my heart God was saying to me is there are people that you have to render unto the Lord. And what I mean by that is inviting them to church isn't rendering them anywhere. When you render somebody, you have to physically remove them out of the circumstances, situation, environment they are in. Place them into a healthy place that they can be offered the healing of what God has. In my office, there's a picture. There's, there's several things in my office. And I, when I heard this, I say, okay, God, we got to render people unto the Lord. You got to look at people that are in unhealthy situations and you got to provide a safe place. In recovery ministry, we have terms that we use all the time people, places, things. If you've got a life that needs a radical change, then things have to change radically if you're really going to change. So we talk about people, places, things. You've got to remove those people from your life, the places that you used to go. And all of these things And what we found in jail ministry with Larry Reed at First Baptist Church in Corinth. And we had this conversation, jail ministry. You go to guys, they genuinely accept Christ. But when they get out, they go back into the same environment, back into the same places. And it's like that Chinese water torture. It's constant dripping. And it's constantly around them. And the apartments that they can afford to go into when they walk into that apartment, they're watching three or four drug deals take place on their way into their apartment. We said, God, we got to do something. So our church did. We planted a church. Last thing Tupelo needed was another church. You can't throw a rock in Tupelo without breaking a stained glass window. <laughs> For eight months, I told everybody around me, he said, we need to plant a church, we need to plant a church. No, we don't need to plant a church. We don't need another church. We just need the churches in Tupelo to get started ministering, help open healing to hurting people. What I realized was, get me straight on this, because I don't, I don't want to be offensive, but I, I do want to disturb you just a little bit. So can I walk that fine line just a second? Yeah, yeah. Pastors, if they just automatically change their church radically, they're probably going to get run off. The traditional church can't handle my church. What I mean by that is, if I say everybody in here has got a, in my church on Sunday morning, I've done this. Everybody in here been to jail, has a criminal record, stand up. Man, we've got 80% of our church standing up. We've got tattoos and piercings all over the place. And you know what? We're worshiping and having a great time. You know why? Because they want to be a part of a church that's providing help, hope, and healing to hurting people. And it's beautiful to me. I've got, I've got people that have been in church their whole life sitting next to a guy that's got artwork from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And they're sitting there talking and admiring each other's artwork. You know, and I was like, what artwork? Was it? You know, he painted a house or something, and that was the artwork he was admiring. And he painted his body, and they're changing. Listen to me carefully. What God began to do is he began to show us how to minister help, hope, and healing. We planted the Transformation Ranch for drug facility for people to recover from drug. We then started the Transformation Garden. 
for girls that are fighting drug addiction. At home, Transformation Home. Now we're going to the Transformation Garden, which is what Steve's a part, and that's why we're here. But let me tell you how we got there real quick. Here's how we got there. I'm a man, and Steve and I share one common trait. Both of our hearts have been broke by Jesus. And I weep with you, brother. So, and I will whip any man that questions my masculinity, so let's get that set. <laughs> but at the time, let me explain something to you. My heart began to be broken. Why? Because I'm ministering to these girls and these men, and I'm hearing their stories. I started sitting down with these girls that were coming out of a lifetime of addiction. And I'm the first man that they've trusted in their life to share a lot of these stuff with, and I'm, I, I don't take that lightly. For some of them, I'm the only father that hasn't hurt them. For some of them, I'm, I'm the only person that's genuinely given them unconditional love without expecting anything in return. They have no idea what that looks like from a man. And they start telling me their story. And, and I started hearing them cry. And I started hearing cries of their past. When they would talk about being chained to a bed, for 17 days in a row while men were run into them to pay their drug debt off. Hear the stories of being molested and raped as children, innocent children, babies. And they started telling me about nights that they would be in different places and they would be crying for help, begging for God to send somebody to help them. And that was the cries of help that I've been hearing for a long time. People in addiction, people in pain, people bitter and angry. And then a pain in my heart came when I realized what I was doing when these girls were crying for help. I was coaching basketball and attending church. I was attending church. I was bragging about the fact that I was faithful to my wife and I went through a whole season without cussing any official or a player out. I thought that was a ma major accomplishment. And God was saying to me, I'm calling you into some difficult places to do those difficult things that no one else will do. But they will be very angry at you because it will reveal their own shortage. See, we have a choice. When God gives us a message, we receive the message and then respond to it. Or we can't get angry at God, we get angry at the messenger. And a lot of times we do that. We get angry at the messenger because the message is challenging us to the core. So what God is calling us right now, and, and, he's, and he's speaking to us in a major way, and he's saying, you got to do something. you got to do something. And, and Lee, I didn't get your permission before, but would you just stand up for just a second so I could put a face in this just for a second, okay? Now, this is the, a lot of you don't know her, and I'm just going to tell you just how big God is. My heart starts getting broken. I don't know what to do, but my heart starts getting broken. And God has called me to preach all over the world. I've been in China and Philippines and, and doing great, incredible things that God calls us to in evangelism, right? Come home. And on my flight home from Cuba, I watched a great move of God, but I'm ready. Four kids and a beautiful wife that I'm ready to get home to see. And we land, and the first thing they tell us is we got a seven-hour delay. And I'm like, seven hours? I'm ready to get home to my wife and my kid. And I get mad. I know, see, you think preachers are supposed to be perfect. I, I'm being transparent with you right now. And I say, I was not just upset. I was mad. Seven hours in the airport. It's not one. I hate those things, okay? So I'm sitting in that airport, and I'm sitting down, and, and Kim Edwards is sitting over there, part of our mission team that went to Cuba, and she's sitting over there, and her and Lee strike up a conversation. I'm still mad, okay? So I'm not listening much to the conversation, and I'm just sitting back, and then all of a sudden Lee talk about uh, a way out ministry where she helps in a ministry for those that have been sex trafficked. So I sit up. Didn't want to be real nosy, but I lean in, and she starts sharing about this ministry. 
And so at this point, I'm, 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 my, my flesh is dying out where my spirit is overtaking. Y'all ever been in those moments where you got to die to your flesh, okay? And my flesh is beginning to die so the spirit of God can take over and begin to really speak. And listen, Holy Spirit starts doing an incredible thing. He starts pounding away at my heart. And my heart is just pounding as I, I start listening to her share. And, and, and she went into her personal story and she begins to share. And I'm like, and Kim says, David, are you listening to this? I said, yes, she had me at hello. <laughs> she had me at hello. And then we start sharing our vision and she starts sharing the need for beds. And I came back and I, I, I told Warren, he's our director of Grace and Mercy Ministries, and I said, Warren, we got to do something. And, and everybody in our church and everybody in our ministry, I get this look in my face and I start crying when I say I got to do something. And that's when they start really getting nervous. Because they know it's fisting really it's fisting to be work for the church and for everybody involved. It's fisting to be some work. And so we started making phone calls because of your heart in sharing. God's just that the next hours flew by as we heard your heart for ministry and we heard what was going on and the need. And I was like already had okay this this ear for the hurting people. And let me just say this to you. While all of this is going on that Steve's talking about and, and everything that's going to be shared today, I want you to keep one thing in mind. What were you doing while this was happening? While this was going on in the lives of so many around the world, what were you doing when this was happening? Okay, that ought to, in turn, I believe this, passionate and compassionate people Act. Before you ever act in passion, though, your heart has to be broken. And you become compassionate. So the initial step in ministry is when your heart is broken to the point it's shattered in pieces. And you say, God, I, I, I can't go on with life anymore. You show me what to do and I'll do it. You just tell me what it is and I'll do it. I don't care what it is. And, and, and one of the things, the reason why God is entrusting us with this was because so many of us have walked away from what we knew to do what God's called us to do. I wouldn't trade my ministry and what God's called me to to go back to coaching for the world. I wouldn't do it as much as I love coaching and as difficult as our ministry is. But the one thing that God is saying to us is, one, what were you doing? Two, what are you going to do now? See, the first thing is, uh, is your heart broken yet? Probably you've already had God prick your heart at the fact you're here. There is no way Steve might can. I don't believe I can. I don't believe, you know, there's some people that maybe can impact a lot of pastors and preachers. But, you know, I, I know a lot of preachers in Tupelo and everything. But you know how hard it is to get churches to come together, to set apart. I mean, don't get me wrong. Listen to me. <laughs> I'm trying to maintain calm right now. I'm just really, this is composure right. for me normally, all right? This is composure from what I normally like. But, but one thing, we will argue theology all day long, but we won't walk across the street to a hurting person to share Jesus with them for a minute. We won't hug somebody that needs a hug. We won't do what God's called us to do. I was that guy. I would go preach in front of thousands. It didn't bother me. I preached the word of love, preaching the word of love, teaching. But my question is, will you share the love of Jesus? I'm not interested in your worship on Sunday. I'm interested in your life Monday through Saturday. I'm not really interested in your theology. I'm not into theology. I'm into my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and a personal, intimate relationship with Him. Amen. I've been arguing theology a long time, and I thought I was doing good when I got my point across. But God hadn't called us to defend theology. God's called us to minister to hurting people. Your heart has to be broken. I know most of you wouldn't be here if your heart wasn't broken. But you need to be sharing with other people to get their hearts broken. Because once your heart is broken... At some point, you've got to act. You've got to do something. And that's where we are right now. We were going to step out and do this ministry. You're going to hear a lot about it. We've, we've got a budget to set up. And I sat here and looked at this one. I was like, oh, my goodness. Every ministry we've ever stepped out by faith to do, 
God is blessed and honored. But now what God's calling us to is something bigger than the anchor church. God told me from the ministries of help, providing help, hope, and healing to hurting people, God was going to melt churches' hearts together. I don't believe that's going to be done from the top. I'm going to believe that's going to be done from the remnant of God's people. There's people inside of every single church that's hearts are broken over topics and subjects. And you can't just go sit in church anymore, just exist. And you gotta do something. Amen. What I want is that compassionate heart, that broken heart, to turn to passion. Passionate people accomplish things in life. Their passion drives them. It drives them to step out of the comfortable into the uncomfortable. It, it causes them to step out on faith. It causes them to do things that man can't explain nor take the credit for. That's passionate people. But you never be acting with passion until your heart's been broken to the point that you can't breathe. Today, my prayer is your heart would be broken to that point. Not only that, but it caused you to act. When God moved me from the pulpit to the streets, always been in the pulpit, even as coach ball, I was preaching and teaching. But when God moved me from the pulpit to the streets, he used one thing. My wife sent me to Walmart, and I heard a sermon right before I walked into Walmart, and it was David Platt and Francis Chan having a conversation that they had on the airport coming back from the Passion Conference. And they asked each other, when's the last time you led somebody to the Lord outside of a church building? And both of them said, I can't remember. And David Platt asked Francis Chan, do you have a hard time sharing Jesus one-on-one? -on -one? He said, I have the hardest time. I'll stand up in front of 100,000 people and preach, but walk up to one individual and talk to him scares me to death. From that conversation, I went, that's me. I've seen hundreds just got back from the Philippines. We had over a 1,000 people get saved in the Philippines in 14 days. That's beautiful, right? Praise God. But God's not interested if I'm willing to go to the Philippines. He's interested if I'm willing to go to Walmart. And I walked in Walmart, and I come down this aisle, and I'm not, I'm not a shopper. I mean, without cell phones, my wife wouldn't trust me in Walmart. My wife sends me a text message with a list. I still get it wrong. So I'm looking at my cell phone with this list, and I'm going down Walmart aisle, and I'm having to go. I have to go about every one of them. I don't know why I can't pick. It's the last one, that whatever it is I'm looking for. It's the last one. But it's a man thing because I won't ask anybody. I know they require people at Walmart to know every item that's in that store and where it's located, but no, I can find it. <laughs> So I'm walking through Walmart, and I'm going down the aisle, and I, I come up, and this lady's coming towards me, and she's walking towards me, and she gets right real close to me. She gets real close to me. God says, pray for her. So I'm walking right down the aisle, and I get close to her, and I said, to God, please be with this lady that you're walking right here. Whatever's going on in her life right now, you just be with her in Jesus' name. Amen. He said, David, that wasn't what I was talking about. I said, God, she's going to freak out. You're going to be a man walking up to her in Walmart. I mean, it's, it's like... I know church members will see their pastor talking to a woman in Walmart, and that would just all over rumor mills everywhere. All these excuses. I turned the next aisle. When I turned down the next aisle, guess who's walking? Strange thing. God says, pray for her. I said, God, I already did. Uh, this, uh, got these items, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm busy, and I'm, you know, I'm a pastor now. I can't just stop and, and pray with people. <laughs> I've got to get back to Facebook and, and, and talk about Calvinism, Arminianism, important stuff like that. And, 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 and here I go, and God just, boom, hammers away at me. And I turn, and I walk past her the second time, and I turn, and this is, is as vivid and as real as it happened just a few minutes ago. And the Holy Spirit pressed on my heart and said, last time. I don't think it was just the last time for that. I think it was the last time God was going to trust me with something of this nature, this big. So I walked up to her and said, ma'am, excuse me. But I just feel so pressing right now, God, that I'm supposed to pray for you. 
is there anything I can pray for you about? Tears started rolling down her face and she said, I'm just coming from the doctor and I've been diagnosed with cancer and they haven't given me long to live. I've come to Walmart to get my husband's favorite meal and I'm going to fix it for him and I'm going to tell him tonight. I didn't care anymore. I grabbed her and I started hugging her and we prayed. We had a time with Jesus. I took off a bracelet I had on and I put it on her wrist and I said, I want you to be reminded that God loved you so much that he demanded that a man pray for you to let you know. And God said, do you know how many? Listen to me. It's a sweet story, but listen to this. Here's the tragedy. Do you, God said to me, do you know how many preachers and church members have walked past people I asked him to pray for that were in the same need? We can't walk past them anymore. I'm in the airports now, and I'm, I am a hulk. <laughs> if I see a grown man with a little girl, I am a hulk. I'm following them around. I'm asking, baby, is this your daddy? And I'm looking up at him. She really yours? <laughs> Got a DNA test? <laughs> Guys, we can't do this anymore. And listen, I don't know about you, but I'm done attending church. Don't get me wrong. I get paid to be there. So I'm going to be there. But as long as there's a breath inside of me, every message is going to be compelling people to get outside the church walls and minister help, hope, and healing to hurting people. That is not about, you can have your theology so square and you can be as straight as a gun barrel, but you can be just as empty. And it's time for us, the church, to step up to accomplish what God has said. And listen, I, I don't believe, I, I happen to be a pastor, but I don't believe this is coming from the pastors. I believe it's coming from the remnant that's going to unite hearts. And then the pastors will get on board. Eventually the pastors will get on board. I'm not giving up on pastors, Brother Terry. I see you, brother. But I believe, I believe God is calling us as individuals to use the gift set He has for us to accomplish the kingdom work. Fist and take a break, and we're going to have some wonderful speakers for you the rest of this day. Incredible things are going to be going on today. Our stepping out and what God's called us to, you might have heard all kinds of crazy rumors about uh, David Ball and the Anchor Church and... Uh, we just recently purchased First Baptist Church. I encourage you to come find out what God is doing. Find out what God is doing. Just come and, and, and talk to me and share because what God has called us to is, is to act on what He's broken our heart for. Just simply act on what God's broken our heart. Guys, we're not here to build a congregation. I told our church from the day one, we're not here to build a congregation. A congregation has grown around the kingdom work that God's called us to. It's a byproduct. It is. It's just a byproduct. We're not focusing on collecting members. And, and, and I'll, I'll close with this, and I'm going to introduce some good friends of mine and how that God has called them to step into ministry here in this area. Steve Gaines, a lot of you know him. He's a pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church, Memphis, Tennessee. He and I were having lunch, and he told me, he said, God's called us to be fishers of men, and we become keepers of aquarium. We're, 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 we're collecting fish. And what we do is something new happens in a church and all the fish go run over there to that church. And that church gets old and so then they go to the new thing. and We're just swapping fish from aquarium to aquarium. And we're not fishing like God called us to, to the hurting people. So God's calling us to get outside the walls. God's calling us to minister help, hope, and healing to hurting people. My prayer God would break your heart and you would become compassionate. And that compassion would grow to passion and cause you to act. And that's our prayer for today, in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Mike and Kay Pittman, I want you to come here now and introduce you guys. Uh, this is Mike and Kay Pittman. Uh, they're a part of our church, but more importantly, they're a part of ministry. And they have been led by God to become a part of the Transformation Garden. And the ministry, we're going to be providing 20 beds. And over there you said 600 beds, and I said, we're going to provide 20, and all of a sudden I start thinking. And I, I know Warren was back there shaking his head, Lord, now David's going to, it's just, 
how, how can we get more beds now? I, I, hear, I see David, we need more, we need more, and we do, and we do. So this isn't competition, this is us uniting together to advance the kingdom of God. I'm Mike and Kate Pittman, my brother's cup coffee. Um, I'm a big coffee drinker, uh, so I'm helping ministry uh, go forth. <laughs> as uh, You're about to leave next week, matter of fact, right? Well, next Wednesday, you'll be going to uh, Myanmar and going to be on ministry. And my brother's cup coffee takes the proceeds of that, and they go uh, on mission trips. Not only that, but they have partnered with the garden as God provides and as God continues to provide. And they're committing and what they want to do if God's provision prevails. And that means you got to drink a lot more coffee. Okay, so what that means. So another pot, add a pot every morning, every one of you, add one more pot. And, and their ministry can continue to, to grow and support the Transformation Garden and what we're going to be doing and the 20 girls that we're going to be reaching out to and, and ministering to. Okay, so I just want them to pray for us. Uh, share just a second and, and then pray for us as, as we go. And we're going to, as soon as they're through, we're going to be taking a break just for a little bit. Uh, so you can go drink some more Brother's Cup coffee outside. Hey, you're doing ministry when you do it, right? Like y'all needed an excuse for that, right? Uh, but this is Mike and Kay Pittman and uh, just heart, compassionate, passionate heart for, for people and for ministry. One of the things I'm very thankful for, I've got a lot of things I'm thankful for. One of them is God didn't call me to be a pastor. So, thank you. so I'm I'm not long-winded, and I, you know, I, I'm kind of brief and to the point, and uh, so I'm just an average guy. I came out of a paper mill uh, 30 years ago. God radically changed me. I'm just an average guy. I'm just a church member. Well, matter of fact, I wasn't raised in church, but God shook my world so much that. Uh, it started to, to evolve work in my life that, that had meaning. Before, before Jesus came into my life, it was nothing. But now, God has done miraculous things in our life. Started Ronald McDonald House Ministry uh, 25 years ago, where we served the children of St. Jude's. And um, then I started going into, had the opportunity to go into China 20 years ago. My heart was broken for the underground church, the persecuted church. And that's where my brother's cup comes in. It was, uh, God moved me over into southwest China, and that happens to be a coffee growing region. And uh, you need a platform to work off of when you go into these dark countries. So that gave me a, a platform to work off of in, in China. So that birthed my brother's cup. And my brother's cup came um, by way of the way, where the idea came from. If you've ever, ever heard of uh, Voice of the Martyrs, uh, I had lunch with a guy over in Kunming, China, and we were discussing what, what kind of business could we get in to, to, to help in this area where, where we're ministering. And he said, y'all look at coffee. And uh, so I, that began my brother's cup. But what my brother's cup does is uh, we're a roaster facility. We roast coffee and we package it. And we send it all over the U.S. And our profits go to support the, the foreign mission work. I'm going uh, Wednesday to lead a medical teams into the jungles of Myanmar, which is called Burma now. There's fighting. There's uh, there's, if you, you can Google it on the news, there's a lot of atrocities that are going on there right now. We're going in to minister to the, to the refugees, the people that are fleeing the fighting. We're bringing in uh, uh, medical help to Buddhists, to Muslims, to, to uh, Hindus, to whoever. We're going to minister to them. We're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ as we do it. And so we're hoping, we're going into unreached areas. We're going into the difficult areas of the world to bring the gospel primarily through medical clinics and but you know when i was over in uh, china uh, many years ago and up in the north west china muslim country up there i got introduced to our an, an organization called starfish and it was tra sex trafficking and uh, that it was a wonderful ministry and that kind of broke my heart for, for the sex traffic in the world. You know, I didn't know how to, to go about, uh, you know, how, do you, how do you be involved and in, in minister to something like that? So 
the garden came, the transformation garden came up. So that's our great opportunity to plug in with our profits. Our profits go to to go into the difficult parts of the world. We we go to bring the, the gospel into the unreached area where they've never heard the gospel. And also our our funds are going to support the transformation garden to for sex trafficked people. And so it's uh, it's amazing what God can do with just common, ordinary people. You know, I, I'm not...